Our topic is Joseph's faithfulness and then progressive unfaithfulness. And this is a theme we're going to find throughout the book, but for the sake of uh, keeping labels short for uh, labeling things, we'll just call this faithfulness, then progressive unfaithfulness. And I'm going to read chapter 1, but we're going to be looking at 122 and following, about three or four verses, and then we'll look at some more this afternoon. <clears throat> now the death of Joshua, after the death of Joshua, came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up? Who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. So Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me to it my allotted territory, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. And Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the, per and the Perizzites into their hand. And they killed 10,000 men at Bezek. And they found Adonai Bezek and Bezek, and they fought against him, and they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Then Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to gather scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. Then they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Now the children of Judah fought against Jerusalem and took it. They struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterward the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountains in the south and in the lowland. Then Judah went up against the Canaanites who dwell in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kirjath Arba, and they killed Shishai, Ahimon, and Telmai. <clears throat> and from there they went against the inhabitants of Debir. The name of Debir was formerly Kirjath Sefer. Then Caleb said, Whoever attacks Kirjath Sefer and takes it, takes it. To him will I give my daughter Achsah as wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it. So he gave him his daughter Achsah as wife. Now it happened when she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field, and she dismounted from her donkey. And Caleb said to her, What do you want? So she said to him, Give me a blessing. Since you have given me land on the south, give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Now the children of the Canaanite, Moses' father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms of the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the south near Arad. And they went and dwelt among the people. And Judah went with his brother Simeon, and they attacked the Canaanites who inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. So the name of the city was called Horma. Also Judah took Gaza with its territory, Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. So the Lord was with Judah, and they drove out the mountaineers, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland because they had chariots of iron. And they gave Hebron to Caleb, as Moses had said. Then he expelled from there the three sons of Anak. But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. So the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Okay, keep in mind, this is probably written by Samuel. And the house of Judah also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. So the house of Joseph, excuse me, the house of Joseph, this is our text here. And the house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph sent men to spy out Bethel. The name of the city was formerly Luz. And when the spies saw a man coming out of the city, they said to him, please show us the entrance to the city, and then we will show you mercy. <clears throat> so he showed them the entrance to the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword. But they let the man and his family go. And the man went to the land of the Hittites, that's above Israel, that's far north, built a city and called its name Luz, which is its name to this day. However, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Bashin, or its, or its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, and the inhabitants of Iblim and its villages, and the inhabitants of Meg, Meg, Medigo and its villages, for the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites under tribute, but did not completely drive them out, nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer. So the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer to the, among them. Nor did Zebulon drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, or the inhabitants of Nehalol. So the Canaanites dwelled among them, and they put them under tribute. Nor did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko, or the inhabitants of Sidon, or Ablab, and Akzib, Helba, or Afik, or Reha. So the Asherites dwell among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Nor did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, or the inhabitants of Beth Anoth. And those Shemesh and Anoth are both false gods. 
they dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemosh and Beth Anath were put under tribute to, to them. <coughs> and the Amor Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they could not allow them to come down to the valley. And the Amorites were determined to dwell in Mount Herez and Ahajan and Shalbim. Yet when the strength of the house of Joseph became greater, they, they were put under tribute. Now the boundary of the Amorites was from the ascent of Akrabim from Sela and upward. So we see here a progressive faithfulness to unfaithfulness. And it'll uh, greatly, we'll see things greatly de descend into uh, chaos after chapter 2 begins. <clears throat> So we're going to look at Joseph's faithfulness in 1, 22 to 26. And then examine Manasseh and Ephraim's progressive unfaithfulness in 1, 27 to 29. And that we'll deal with that this morning and this afternoon. First, we want to tie up a few loose ends from last week. Uh, I didn't get to finish the application from last week, so I'm just going to be very brief. Uh, you could think of this as a review. And we'll, we'll briefly note reasons why a weak, defective faith leads to failure. And there are a number of things to consider. Number one, last week we looked at the fact that it is common for some professing Christians to believe what they consider easy things, while they doubt and even disbelieve the hard things. Very common. <clears throat> this is a very dangerous and spiritually harmful way of treating the Word of God. And uh, we sang that psalm uh, earlier, 78. Psalm 78 talked about Ephraim, didn't drive out the Canaanites, and then it talked about they had no reason to doubt the Lord, and it talked about all the miracles and bringing them out of Egypt. They had no reason not to do it. <clears throat> to treat the inspired word of God like a smorgasbord is the path to disobedience and declension. The system of doctrine and ethics in the Bible is a package, an organic unity, fully a fully integrated system. <clears throat> if one doctrine is denied and then twisted to fit one's lack of faith, it will have a negative and perverted effect on other crucial areas of doctrine or ethics. Now, I didn't give you examples, but there are several examples. Arminianism, for example, leads to a deficient view, doctrine of God. God can't save. God is limited by man's free will. God can't get the job done. It, it affects the doctrine of salvation. It affects the doctrine of sanctification. It affects the doctrine of God. A deficiency in one area leads to deficiency in other areas. This is very true. It was the refusal to accept the creation narrative and the universal flood that led to liberalism or modernism. The mainline Protestant denominations were destroyed by such rank, un rank unbelief, and now they have much more in common with heathenism and atheistic secular humanism than biblical Christianity. <clears throat> and there was a crisis. It developed out of their faulty apologetic. They actually thought that men could be neutral and that science was honest and neutral, and therefore when evolution came along, they thought, well, man, well, this doesn't really fit with the narrative in Genesis. Uh, so we've got to start uh, adapting the Bible to some modern so-called science. And it wasn't scientific at all, but they thought it was. And therefore, uh, they denied the, the creation narrative, and they ended up denying, uh, then they denied the universal flood and then they denied all the miracles, and then they denied the atonement, and then they denied the resurrection, and they denied the virgin birth. And they don't have Christianity anymore. They have just a, a form of paganism that uses Christian terminology here and there. Dispensationalism refused to believe in the moral law of God in the Old Testament, and the result was antinomianism in churches, injustice in church courts, and secular positivistic law in the civil government. You know, you have churches where uh, people are committing adultery, but people are upset. I remember there was a Baptist church, and they had a big debate. Uh, a man came to church. He wasn't wearing a white shirt. He was wearing a lavender shirt. And so they had this big, huge fight and argument about whether it was okay for men to wear colored shirts to, shirt, to church. I'm serious. This is a true story. 
uh, they weren't dealing with actual immorality. They were dealing with a bunch of nonsense. We must believe everything in Scripture, even the details, even everything related to science and history. And yes, prophecy. The things that are hard to believe. Postmillennialism is hard to believe. When you look at the world around us, now things are getting worse and worse, it looks like. It's hard to believe. But it's true. It will come to pass. And we don't know when Christ is going to come back. He might come back in 2,000 years. There might be a nuclear war, and then all the liberals in the cities are killed, and the Christians take over. We have no idea what's going to happen in the future. So to doubt God is simply nonsense. Number two, we must use our faith and trust in God to overcome our fear of enemies and our fear of failure. <clears throat> the men of Judah were cowards in the presence of iron chariots. Now, fear is a natural response to going into a bloody battle. You know, we, we have battle where people have AK-47s and they have M15s and they're shooting each other from a distance and blowing people's heads off and so forth. And, uh, but that's not near as grotesque and tough as going into battle with swords and chopping arms off and cutting heads off and so forth. Fear without adequate faith leads to retreat or a, one, a running away from battle. The man full of fear says to himself, I will fight on a different day sometime in the future. I'm not going to fight today. I'm too afraid. <clears throat> Faith says there are tough times, but our God is much stronger. And since he has promised victory and orders to go, I will go with confidence in victory. Okay, your faith must overcome your fear. Never allow fear to overcome your faith. I will look away from my weakness to God. And the perfect example of this kind of faith, a faith which conquers for God, is David when he was a youth. Now, I'm just, it's kind of a long passage, but I want to read this because this is probably the best example in Scripture. 1 Samuel 17, 2 to 30, 2 to 30 uh I'll read chapter, most of chapter 17. And Saul and the men, the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath whose height was six cubits in a span. So he's about as tall as a modern basketball player. You know, he's around, he's probably seven feet five or something. He's this big, massive guy. <clears throat> he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the, coat, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spear weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of, of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he, if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now listen to the response. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. <clears throat> now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to battle. The name of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistines drew near and presented himself, the Philistine drew near and presented himself forty days, morning and evening. 
Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of dried grain and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp. And carry these ten cheeses to the captain of the, of the thousand, and see how your brothers are, your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took the things, and went as Jesse had commanded him, and he came to the camp of the army. As the army was going out to fight, and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. David left his supplies in the hands of the keeper, supply keeper, and ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming <coughs> up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the name, the same word. So David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who killed him, the king will enrich with great riches and give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Okay, he's confessing his faith here. And the people answered in this manner, saying, So it shall be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. <coughs> and Eliab's anger was roused against David, and he said, Why do you come down here? And with whom have you left the few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned for him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now when the words of David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, excuse, yeah, then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. <clears throat> Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after them and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. <clears throat> now here, here's the confession of faith here. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw uh, of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor and put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. And David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he, was, he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took a staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch, which he had. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And the Philistine looked about and saw David. He disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you should come with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. <clears throat> so it was, 
When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead. And he fell on his face to the earth. Okay, it cracked right into his skull. And the kind of sling they're talking about, it's about so long, it's got a little leather bag in the end, and they swing it and get it going super fast, and then they whoosh. And so it's traveling at probably about 150 miles an hour when it hits him in the forehead. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley to the gates of Ekron. And the, wound, and the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Sherahim, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Though the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put his armor in his tent. Okay, well, just note the following. I mean, it's one of the greatest stories of faith in the Bible. What is David? 12, 13 years old, maybe? The age of going to war was 20, so he's definitely a teenager. He's mocked by his own brothers. All the armies of Israel are totally afraid of this. I, I can imagine a guy who's the size of Andre the Giant, if you remember wrestling. He's over seven feet tall, probably. He's extremely muscular. We know that from his armor. He's covered with mail, so you can't strike him with a sword and kill him that way. And David has complete faith in God. He doesn't confess faith in himself. He does say he's killed lions and bears, but he says, the Lord enabled me to do this, and he gives all the credit to the Lord. So number one, note the following observations. The soldiers and leaders in Israel were greatly afraid, did not believe in victory, and publicly confessed their lack of faith. For 40 days, we can't do anything. They didn't attack. Two, David believed in victory through God and publicly confessed his trust and confidence in God. Then David acted on his faith and had victory. Three, David's example of faith and obedience caused the armies of Israel to go forth and slaughter God's enemies. In this respect, David acted like one of the judges. And then four, we see in this section of scripture the great importance of good biblical leadership. And we see that in the book of Judges. When they have a judge, and they're driven to despair, and they pray to God, and God raises up a judge, the judge leads them to victory. So I just wanted to bring that up. That's an amazing, amazing section of scripture. And then number three, this will be our last thing before we move on to our new text here. A fear of, a fear of failure coupled with a lack of faith leads to a refusal to try, complacency, and idleness. There are many things that the church refuses to do because of worldliness and laziness. People do not want the responsibility of dominion so they hand their children over to state schools and seek peace with the enemy on their terms. Evangelicals, 95% of evangelicals, and I would say probably over 50% of Reformed churches, send all their children to Molech, Baalite state schools to be indoctrinated in the ways of Satan. Evangelicals try to counteract this with an hour of Mediocre Sunday school on Sunday. At least Reformed churches teach catechization and daily work, family worship and so forth. But 20 minutes of family worship compared to, uh, you know, 35, 40 hours of satanic teaching every week. Uh, not a good idea. The enemy is not driven out, but accepted with many excuses. An unbiblical pietism is based on a retreatist theology that masks disobedience and laziness with phony calls regarding personal piety. Now, don't get me wrong, personal piety is the starting point of everything. But our call is to disciple the nations. It's a very broad goal. 
it's much more than simply uh, start a Bible study. You know, we, we start somewhere, but we have a goal. Do not make peace with secular humanists and pagans. In addition, never make peace with sin in your life. So if we want a personal application, that's it. If there are sins that appear as chariots of iron, do not doubt or give up, but persevere unto victory against that particular sin. That sin that you may cherish and refuse to slay will be all too happy to defeat and enslave you. Okay, those are the applications I didn't have time for last week, or actually did, I didn't finish. So let's look at Caleb's reward of faith. In verse 20, Caleb receives his inheritance. <clears throat> and they gave Hebron to Caleb, as Moses had said. Then he expelled from there the three sons of Anak. Now the promise of Moses is found back in Numbers 14.24. Here's what it says. But my servant Caleb, because he had a different spirit in him and followed and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land that he went and his descendants shall inherit it. There's the promise. Now, the name Hebron means association or league. The city is about 25 miles south, southwest of Jerusalem. It is 2,800 feet above sea level, situated between two ridges and a valley. A large number of springs and wells are found in that area. And that's why it's been inhabited since at least 3,500 B.C. It's a natural place for human settlement. There's been continuous people living there since at least 3,500 B.C. Abraham lived in Mamre, one and two-thirds miles north of the city of Hebron, which is part of the Hebron area where Caleb, which Caleb inherited. Abraham moved to this part of Hebron after departing from Lot, Genesis 13, 18. Abraham, still called Abram, built the first temple to Yahweh on that location. The valley there is not only well watered, but has rich soil. Apples, plums, figs, Pomegranates, apples, grapes, melons, apricots, and nuts are grown in the Hebron area in abundance. Rich soil, lots of water. So Caleb was well rewarded for his faith and obedience. It was from the brook Eshkol in Hebron that the spies took back the uh, amazing large crust clusters of grapes. They took back these huge clusters of grapes that were like a foot long and show them to the people of Israel. Look at what's in the land waiting for you. If you have faith and you obey, of course. <clears throat> so the city was special in Israelite's, Israelite history. It is where Sarah died and Abram bought the cave of Machpelah, Genesis 23, 17. It is where Sarah and all the patriarchs are buried. It's the burial place of the patriarchs. And it is where David reigned after the death of Saul for seven and a half years. 2 Saul 3.1. So Caleb is well rewarded for his faith and obedience, receiving a very special place in Israel's history. In Joshua 14, 6 to 15, we read about the details of when Joshua gave Hebron and its surrounding area to Caleb. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly follow the Lord my God. <clears throat> so Moses swore to me, Swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance, and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, 85 years old. 
as yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now it is my strength for war, both for going out and coming in. Now therefore give me this mountain on which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord has said. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim, those are the giants. Then the land had rest from war. Now, the city itself was a Levitical city and, had a city, and was a city of refuge. Joshua 21, 11 to 13, and he gave them the Levites, or the children of Levi, Kirjath Arba. Arba was the father of Anak, which is Hebron, in the mountains of Judah, which is common land and the, with common land surrounding it. But the fields of the city and the villages they gave to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as its possession. Thus to the children of Aaron the priest, they gave Hebron with its common land, a city of refuge for the slayer. Now remember, the Levites didn't have their own allotment of land. They had cities within allotments of land with areas for gardening and so forth. Now Caleb, we're still in the part of Judges where the focus is on victory and obedience. Caleb is the supreme example of faith and obedience leading to covenant blessings. He had a long life. He had excellent health. And he had economic prosperity. He had received promises for his great faith as a spy when all others except Joshua had no faith and expressed defeatism. Remember that? We can't do it. It just, it's impossible for us to win. Let's select a leader. Let's go back to Egypt. And then God promised them they would all die in the wilderness with no land. He waited patiently for at least 45 years before receiving his promised inheritance. Even in his 80s, he was happy and willing to fight against God enemy, God's enemies. And he stands as a great contrast with those who do not have faith in God. He, together with his clan, drove the giants out of Hebron. But the Benjamites, in the next verse, could not drive out the regular-sized warriors, the Jebusites, from Jerusalem. So we start with victory, and now we're going to turn to Benjamin's failure. And this chapter's we're in a part of the chapter one, which is the turning point that's going to explain the rest of the book, the declension and, and the, the problems. Judges 121, but the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. So the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. And once again, we think this is written by Samuel. Uh, so David will completely eliminate the Jebusites from Jerusalem. Uh, after Samuel's death. The Jebusites are an ancient people, mentioned first in Genesis 10, 15 to 16, as descended from Canaan. Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Hath, the Jebusite, the Amorite, and the Girgashite. As dwellers in Canaan, at some point in their history, they inhabited Jerusalem and made it their stronghold city. And you've seen pictures of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's on, you know, these uprising of rock and hills, uh, making it a stronghold, a natural stronghold. After inhabiting Jerusalem, they renamed it Jebus. After it was finally captured by David, it immediately was called Jerusalem again. It had been Jerusalem. They named it Jebus, and then when the Jews took it back, it goes back to being Jerusalem. David understood the strategic location and geography of Jerusalem and made it his capital. And of course, God made it the place of Mount Zion, the place where the temple dwelt in his special presence. In Joshua 15, 63, after a detailed description of Judah's border and cities, we read this. As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Israel to this day. Once again, this is 
very likely written by Samuel. <coughs> Calvin thinks it was written by Eli, but um, I think mean, Samuel's a better argument. We saw earlier that Judah attacked Jerusalem and burned it. This is easily explained in, in uh, that either A, they defeated it but did not leave sufficient forces behind to hold it. And we've noticed this is a common problem. We find that places are defeated and then the pagans come back and, you know, re redwell on that land. That's one problem. Or B, Judah only destroyed the southern part of the city for the northern part which included the citadel and the best defenses were within Benjamin's territory. And this is the view of uh, Matthew Henry, Paulus Gasol, and this is the view of Jos Josephus uh, and a number of scholars. So it's a very common view. Yeah, they burnt Jerusalem, but they, they burnt the easy part. They didn't, get to, they didn't get the citadel. They didn't conquer the whole thing. That's possible. The boundary line of the tribe of Benjamin and Judah ran through the district of Jerusalem, through the valley of Ben-Hinnon, south of the city, Joshua 15.8. The city already extended outward from the uh, bottom of the citadel. In any case, the job remained unfinished, and it was Benjamin's job to permanently crush the Jebusites. And that, of course, will take place under David, who's from the tribe of Judah. It is bad enough that the Benj Benjaminites could not drive out the Jebusites because of the defectiveness of their faith. <clears throat> but that statement, the Jebusites dwell with the children of Jerusalem to this day, show the, shows the people of God making peace with the heathen in the Benjamites' own territory. Okay, well, we can't drive them out. We don't have enough faith to drive them out. Let's make peace with them. And we're going to look at this later this afternoon. But what is Israel not to do? They're not to make covenants with the heathen. God wants them to destroy all the sacred pillars, all the altars, all the shrines, all the high places. Every remnant of their society, culture, and worship is to be destroyed. The outward difficulties involved in what God required them to accomplish caused them to simply give up and live with a compromise to their duty. They lived in their allotted space, but they shared it with the enemies of God that God had ordered them to destroy. So, and this is a common theme in Joshua and Judges. Unbelief leads to disobedience. A love of the easy path, worldly advantage, and self-indulgence caused them to place the sword of victory in its sheath. They didn't obey God. They said, let's just live with them. We'll make a covenant with them. We'll dwell on the same land. We'll live side by side and we can get on with our farming and our living. And this is one of the main problems with God's people in the book of Judges. By not insisting on total victory, which is what God had clearly commanded them, and instead seeking a compromise where many of the heathen are left in place, they left a stumbling block in their own path because of their temptation to syncretize and intermarry with the heathen. This is a common theme. And if you read the passages, there's many of them. We're going to deal with a really good one from Exodus in, in this afternoon. <clears throat> but the problem is, they become a stumbling block to you. Satan perceived the temptation before them, and he used it to great effect in their declension, which resulted in covenant curses and defeats before their enemies. And we can read other passages where there was a real problem of intermarriage. Those beautiful Canaanites, the men were attracted to them. We do not do any good, ourselves any good, by pretending enemies are not enemies, or by seeking common ground with those who hold a worldview that is satanic and highly offensive to God. Now, yeah, if you want to, it's you know, we want to be merciful, we want to be kind. But you do that by telling them the gospel. You don't do that by making friends with them and having a barbecue and, and accepting their paganism. You're not to have pagan friends at all. You're not to have a pagan wife or a pagan husband. You're not to be in, uh, start a business with a pagan. There is to be no compromise in this area. 
If you want to be kind and merciful, the best thing you can do to them is tell them the gospel. The professing Christians' embrace uh, of religious pluralism in the West has been the stepping stone to their own syncretism, declension, oppression, and persecution. In our day, the pagan secular humanist seems to know better than the average evangelical that opposing law, uh, law orders must be suppressed and crushed. What is the greatest enemy of the secular humanists, the, de the left-wing Democrats, the so-called progressives? What is their greatest enemy? Evangelical Christians. Bible-believing Christians are their greatest enemy, and they know it's their greatest enemy. Because the Bible says, thou shalt not steal, and their whole system of politics is based on theft. Socialism is based on lusting after things that don't belong to you, false victimization, blaming, blaming the rich for your problems, or racism or whatever, and stealing from those. Either through redistribution of wealth from the rich to the poor, which is nothing but rot, rotten theft, or the other thing in the racial sphere, they want uh, to give money from whites to blacks to take care of slavery. So you have people today who never had any slaves, and you had people today who were never slaves, uh, and they want your money. It's called theft. Thus they have captured the schools, they've captured the media, generally speaking, and the courts. And they regard sodomites and cross-dressers as more moral and virtuous than Bible-believing Christians. That's what a lack of faith gives you. That's what neutrality gives you. That's what compromise with the wicked gives you. It makes you a persecuted people. That's what it does. <clears throat> and then let's look at, uh, this is going to be our uh, Roman numeral three, Joseph, or if, uh, that is Ephraim and Manasseh's good beginnings. And we'll start that and then we'll take a break. And Joshua, I mean, excuse me, Judgments 1, 22 to 26, we read of the initial success of the house of Joseph. And the house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. So the house of Joseph sent men to spy out Bethel. The name of the city was formerly Luz. And when the spies saw a man coming out of the city, they said to him, Please show us the entrance to the city. And we will show you mercy. Now, they're not asking where the gate of the city is. That's obvious. A lot of cities had a secret entrance, a secret way to get in. And that's what they're asking for. And we will show you mercy. So he showed them the entrance to the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword. But they let the men and his family go. And the man went to the land of the Hittites, built a city, and called its name Luz, which is its name to this day. And if you look at geography books of ancient Israel, the Hittites are way up north. Now, under normal circumstances, <coughs> the faithful firstborn son would receive the position of leadership and, of course, a double portion of the inheritance. That's the biblical system. If you have a firstborn son who's faithful, that's what he gets. But under divine inspiration, God had Joseph place Judah in a leadership position for the Messiah would come from Judah and the kingship would continue through David. And that's all, you know, when, when Jacob's blessing his sons, uh, there's prophecy there. It's prophecy. It's divine inspiration. It's of God. The Messiah would come through the seed of David. In addition, Joseph, and I should have looked this up, he's either the youngest or second youngest son, received the double portion, Genesis 48:22. Because he saved Israel and thus was a type of Christ. Remember they were starving. There was no food. They have to go to Egypt. Joseph meets him. Joseph saves, saves him. So these verses follow the pattern of judges thus far by not simply giving the name of the tribe involved in the action, but naming the house, the head, the originator of the tribe. Judah goes into battle. Well, what does that mean? Well, Judah stands for Ephraim and Manasseh. or Manasseh and Ephraim. Ephraim. Therefore, instead of speaking of Manasseh or Ephraim going into battle, 
going forth, who are the two sons of Joseph from which these two tribes originated. Our text says the house of Joseph went up. <clears throat> Since Joseph received a double portion, like the firstborn, and was a savior of Israel, a type of Christ, he has a privileged place next to Judah. So faith and obedience, it, once again, is exalted by Scripture and made primary. Now, interestingly, in the beginning when the tribes coming from Joseph are faithful, they are just designated the house of Joseph in his honor. But when they start to decline and backslide, they're no longer called the house of Joseph. They're called Ephraim and Manasseh. They're called by their regular tribal names because they have not lived up to the spiritual obedience of their father. God greatly honors faith and obedience. Now the first city attacked by the house of Joseph is Bethel. Bethel, which means the house of God. Beth, house, El, God. You know the word Elohim. The site has been occupied since at least 3500 BC. The Canaanites worshipped the god El at one time, but El was replaced by Baal in their Canaanite pantheon. The word El for the ba uh, Baalites and the Bible-believing Israelite meant two very different things. Uh, remember, they believed in finite gods limited to certain geographical areas or certain aspects of creation. Uh, Baal is in control of thunder, lightning, and rain, and uh, his consort, Asherah is responsible for animals having children and so forth. This is the second place that Abraham built an altar to Yahweh. In addition, he, is, he called upon the name of Yahweh, indicating praise and worship. The worship of the patriarchs was very simple. The building of an altar was, and the burnt offering was the acknowledgement of one's sin and that one can only approach God through the Messiah to come, Jesus Christ. So you see them, they build an altar, they have a burnt offering. They approach Yahweh through Christ every time. It's the only way. And you remember back in Genesis, when uh, Cain tried to approach God through the fruit of the ground, God said, no way. I need to see the blood, the shed blood, which reminds me of the Messiah to come. Fruit's not going to get the job done. I need to see the blood. Christ, the sinless, spotless, perfect Lamb of God. After, one's, uh, after one places their faith in Christ and acknowledges a perfect atoning sacrifice for sin, then one's prayers and praises are offered and received through Christ. Now, I know that's through typology, but it's true. There was a bare mountaintop at Bethel that served as a worship site until God limited sacrifice to Jerusalem in the temple complex. Genesis 28, 19 speaks of Bethel as a, uh, and I'm not sure how to pronounce the Hebrew here, uh, makam, a sanctuary place. Bethel is the site where Joseph had a vision. I mean, excuse me, Va Jacob had a vision, a special revelation from God in a dream. <clears throat> he saw the ladder reaching up to heaven with angels coming up and down the ladder. And the promise of the covenant with Abraham are restated to him personally by God at this place. <coughs> the latter symbolized the uninterrupted communion between heaven and earth. And those who participate in the covenant are cared for by God's holy angels. And Jesus applied this passage to himself in a special way. On certain crucial occasions of need and victory, we often see angels ministering to Jesus. After the temptation, for example. Angels are present at the resurrection, for example. Angels are present and are celebrating the birth of Christ. Which probably happened in, in September. And they did it once. They didn't do it yearly in December, which is a pagan holy day. In Genesis 28, 19, Jacob names the place Bethel. That formerly had been called Luz. And Jacob called the city the gate of heaven. And he renewed the covenant with Jehovah there after he returned from Padam Aran. <clears throat> Very special place. These are special places. Now Bethel is 12 miles, 
12 miles north, uh, north of Jerusalem and about four miles west and a little south of the city Ephraim. The city arose there because of excellent springs of water near the top of the ridge of hills. Now, if you've ever been to the Middle East, it's a very dry place. Not all of it, but a lot of it's pretty dry. And you need those springs of water for the summer months. It was on a, a crucial trading route that ran east to west from Jericho to the Mediterranean Sea. Bethel is mentioned in Scripture more than any other city except Jerusalem. So once again, it's a very important city. Uh, we're going to take a break and we're going to come back and we're going to look at the taking of Bethel. And it's described in a number of ways. <clears throat> Remember, the book is speaking of victory. Then we see a progressive lack of faith. And then we see ethical compromise where they're making treaties with the pa pagans around them and they're living with the pagans. And then after chapter 2, especially verse 6, we're going to see complete degradation and backsliding. God promised them, if you don't destroy the pagans, if you don't get rid of their sacred sites, if you don't obliterate their culture and religion, it'll be a stumbling block to you, and you will fall. And they did. And that is a warning to us today. Because of dispensationalism, a lot of preachers, they look at the book of Judges and places like Joshua, and they try to get personal little nuggets out for personal piety. You know, don't marry a pagan. Don't be like Samson or whatever. But the book has much to say about social considerations, society, politics, and culture. And so we're going to look at that. But we're going to take a little break first. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing book. Help us to not be like them with the lack of faith. Cause us, Lord, to believe all your promises and not pick and choose, which we like. Cause us to be, to embrace your full orb doctrine. And cause us to march forward toward victory. Even though, as now, we are as grasshoppers compared to the, uh, the mighty pagans around us who control almost every aspect of our society. We know that we will have victory in Christ. <clears throat> For he promised us in the Great Commission, that he would be with us always, even to the end of the age. Therefore, we will have victory, eventually. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>